Have you ever been enticed to go to a department store by advertising for a type of product? You get there, you find many products, none of which are really what you want. You settle for one and you bring it home, and you find out it doesn't match your decor, it doesn't do what you want it to do. You are a victim, a victim of the Industrial Revolution. Now, to be fair, the Industrial Revolution has done great things for society. It spurred the growth of the middle class, it increased the availability of goods, and it lowered their cost. And how it did this was by centralizing mechanized production into a factory, and locating that factory where the cost of labor, material, and energy are low, and there's access to transportation. And this is typically not where the customer is located. Inside the factory, there's specialized high-rate production equipment, and there's tooling specific for the product you're trying to make. So for example, if I'm trying to make a plastic toy car, I'm going to have a set of tooling called a mold. It'll be in the shape of the plastic car, and we're going to inject plastic into that mold. Now, if I want to change the design of the car, or if I want to make a toy bolt, boat, I'm going to need to get a new set of tooling. Now, here's the thing. Tooling takes weeks or months to produce and costs tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars. Now, that's okay because we can spread that cost over tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of the exact same thing. What this leads to is a consumer economy. And the word consumer is apt because you and I as consumers, we have to consume those tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of products of which we've had little to no say in the design or functionality. Now, it wasn't always that way. Let me give you a couple of examples from prior to the Industrial Revolution. The first example is from Laura Ingle Wilder's book, Farmer Boy. Now, in the story of Farmer Boy, there's a circuit-riding cobbler that goes from homestead to homestead over the course of a year, making shoes for the family. And in that story, Almanzo the Farmer Boy steps onto a piece of paper, and the cobbler traces his footprint and takes other measurements of his foot and makes a shoe with the perfect fit for Almanzo. Let me give you another example. Let's say you're a rancher, and you want to be able to distinguish items on your ranch from those of your neighboring ranchers. We're talking about barrels and wagons, and especially cattle. You need a brand. And of course, since this represents your ranch, you're going to put a lot of thought into this. You may even come up with some sketches, and then you're going to go and talk to the blacksmith. Now, the blacksmith may have some templates, and the blacksmith knows what can or can't be done with metalworking, and together, you collaborate and come up with a brand that you want. Let's come to the present time. There's a relatively recent manufacturing technology called 3D printing. And you've probably seen the 3D printer out in the lobby making parts. Well, in 3D printing, what it does is that it takes digital data, computer-aided drawing or CAD data, or 3D scanning data, and the printer will take that information, and from that will deposit or fuse material together layer by layer until a part is made. Now, here's the key. In most cases, you don't need tooling. Now, what does that do for us? Let me give you an example. This is my son's chess tournament trophy. If you look at the structure of the trophy, it is an, it's an assembly of mass-manufactured parts. The only thing that's customized is this little plate on the bottom of the trophy, giving some information in it. In conventional manufacturing, customization is either entirely eliminated or minimized in order to reduce the cost, reduce the cost of tooling. What can we do with 3D printing? This here is a trophy that was designed and printed by a student intern at America Makes here in Youngstown. This was for the first robotics championship, which was held in St. Louis, Missouri. So the gateway arch plays a prominent role in the design of the trophy. The first robotics logo, the triangle, circle, and square, those are also prominent in the structure of the trophy. And uh, this is 3D printing, so they were actually printed interlocked with the gateway arch. Not, this was not printed and assembled afterwards. This was printed this way. The specific event that the trophy's for, the aerial assist, also prominently displayed in the structure, 
So what we have here is a trophy that is much more valuable and meaningful to the recipient than what we could do with conventional manufacturing. Now you see, with 3D printing, it doesn't matter whether the part I'm printing is standardized or whether it's highly customized. If they're basically the same size and shape, it costs the same to print it. What does that mean? It means that customization is free. We should take advantage of that. So what I want to do is talk about two types of customization, and I've already given you examples. The first type of customization, the example is Almanza the farmer boy having his foot measured and getting the shoe with the perfect fit for him. I would call this passive customization. The reason why I call it passive customization is because the customer is passively involved in the design and functionality. The customer comes and has a measurement taken and gets the perfect fit. Now, if you were like me growing up, my teeth were crooked and I needed braces. So I had these mass manufactured metal brackets that were ungainly glued to my teeth. Attaching them was a wire, and the only thing customized about it was the length at which the orthodontist cut the wire. I would have loved to have had something far less visible, something like this. What we see here is a transparent aligner that goes over your teeth. Now, the aligner is not 3D printed. It's thermoformed plastic. Next to it, well, we're seeing the tooling. That's 3D printed. That's what you form the aligner with. Here's how this works. The patient goes to the orthodontist and gets an impression. The impression is sent to the manufacturer. They 3D scan the impression and then generate computer models showing how the teeth will evolve during the course of the treatment. Then they create drawings of the molds for different stages of the treatment, then 3D print the molds, and then form of thermoform the plastic. That aligner then gets mailed to you in the mail. The company that does this, Align Technologies, last year made about 20 million of these, each one with a one-of-a-kind customized 3D printed mold to make the aligner. That's mass customization. It's also passive customization as well. Now I'm going to go back to shoes here. Our family, we're a soccer family. And so whenever we go out to buy soccer cleats, my eldest son, we have to go through shoe after shoe to try to get him the right fit. And that's because his foot's wide. And in a mass manufactured world, we need discrete sizes to be able to handle the uniqueness of the human body. And sometimes it doesn't work. We need the discrete sizes to have discrete sets of tooling. It would be great if my son could have his foot measured to get the perfect fit. Well, you know, the major shoe companies are thinking about this. This is New Balance. Team New Balance track athletes, they have their feet 3D scanned, but they also have their running mechanics measured, and then they get a track, uh, the New Balance will print a uh, cleat plate that is customized for the runner's anatomy and the runner's mechanics. I would love to see my son be able to go into a shoe store at some point and have his foot scanned and have a 3D printed shoe either mailed to him or perhaps one day even printed in the store. Now, the next type of customization I want to talk about is, the, you know, the example is the rancher collaborating with the blacksmith. That's active customization. It's where the customer is actively involved in the designer functionality of the product. For example, I'm wearing a 3D printed bracelet here. Now, this comes from a design, a company called Nervous System in the United Kingdom. It's an interlocking, almost like a chain mail type design. It was all printed at once. Could be used for bracelets, necklaces, and they've even done dresses this way. They have an app on their website that you can use to change the shape and features of the bracelet and then download the file and print it, which I did. But I was actively involved in designing this bracelet for me the way I wanted it. Let's say you're a retailer like the department store I talked about earlier and you want to offer customized products. Well, how do you do that? Well, there's companies thinking about ways to facilitate that. One example here is Twicket. They're out of Belgium. What they're doing is that they're enabling this whole collaboration from the customer. Maybe the customer wants a trophy. Maybe they want a little thing to sit on their desk that says TEDx Youngstown. Maybe they want an adorable uh, nightlight. You, know, you get to choose your animal, choose if your animal's wearing a hat, put your child's name on the nightlight. Well, they're doing the user interface for that part of the collaboration. The retailer, now the retailer could put a kiosk in their store and then it gets mailed to you, or maybe you have an app 
or a website. They're monitoring the sales or offering new products. And on the back end, they're enabling the 3D printing company to get a file ready for print and also the, the aspects of packaging and mailing that product. So the reason why I'm bringing up that example is because when it comes to customization, whether the passive customization where we need the measurement for the perfect fit or active customization where we want the customer involved in the design and functionality of the product to get what they want, we have to enable the business models, the infrastructure, the interfaces, the tools, and the templates to do this. We haven't needed to do that before, so now we need to think differently. Now, passive and active customization, they can happen in the same product form. So for example, this is a bespoke prosthetic cover. Passive customization, measurement of the human anatomy to be sure that this is the correct size. And also, we want to have visual symmetry. Active customization, in this case, the customer wanted something that was like a honeycomb design for the cover, but perhaps a customer might want a solid cover with a color of the human skin with a tattoo on it. That would be active customization. Now, you might be saying, Brett, I, I don't know if I could actively customize a product and select the color, the feel, the shape, or functionality of the product. But I want to say I think you can. It's because of devices like these. Smartphones and tablets. The content on these devices are unique to the individual who has them. Apps, music, video, photos, other pieces of information. We are actively customizing in the virtual realm. I believe we are primed as a society to actively customize physical products. So what I hope you've seen in the last few minutes is that 3D printing is going to transform the consumer by putting custom back in the customer. Thank you.